Hello, welcome to the CGD podcast with me, Rajesh Merchandani. Thanks for joining us. Today, what does the future of development look like? Is it the SDG document the nations will sign up to in a few days' time? In 15 years from now, will we look back at this moment and think of it as a turning point in human history? Big thoughts require big thinkers, and we've gone for the double whammy today. <laughs> Nancy Birdsell, president of CGD, and Michael Elliott, president of the One Campaign. Welcome to you both. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Uh, Pleasure. Nancy, is the SDG agreement the right agreement? I think so, yes. There are at least two things I'd say about it that make it qualify as the right agreement. One is that the word sustainable is there. That's different from the Millennium Development Goals. For me, it implies not only sustainability in the environmental sense, but in the social sense. So it invokes indirectly some of the inequality discussion that's in the document, the SDG goals. Uh, Second, the point is being made that it's universal. And that's built in, that was built in from the beginning. And that means the once rich countries and the once poor countries, which are now a set of countries that have more problems in common than different problems, because we don't have just the poor and just the rich anymore. It's a much more enriched mix. It's goals for all of us. And Michael, that idea of universality, is that a good thing to have in the document, that it applies to all countries? Or should it be like the MDGs were about rich countries helping poor countries? No, I absolutely 100% agree with Nancy. I think we've moved on from that. I think the MDGs were a, were a wonderful success, uh, an extraordinary aid to uh, fighting poverty, preventable disease, and other, and other uh, diminutions of the human spirit. Uh, but we've moved on. And in addition to Nancy's two very strong points, I'd, I'd make two, two others, I think. First of all, it sort of recognises that with the MDGs and, of course, other things that have happened in the last 15 years, we've made tremendous progress on some key indicators, on health indicators and poverty indicators. And the SDGs give us uh, a a way of of doing what what I call a through train. So, in other words, making sure that we continue the progress on those key human development indicators, while at the same time, a second point, beginning to shape a framework which enables us to think of new challenges that are coming along. Climate change is the most obvious one. Other challenges of governance and, uh, and corruption and industrialization and inequality, uh, all of which uh, are issues we know that are going to be uh, more and more salient in the, in the next 15 years. Uh, and the SDG document gives us, gives us the tools to start thinking about those new problems as well as continuing progress on the older ones. But I mean, you, you talked about the MDGs, Nancy, you talked about the MDGs as well. Michael, you talked about the success of the MDGs, but the world did not achieve all the MDGs. So there wasn't success in those. And there's only eight of those. There's 17 of these in the same time frame. So are we setting ourselves up to fail? Well, we're setting ourselves up for a challenge. Uh, there's no question about that. We're setting ourselves up for an enormous challenge. We've got 17 goals. We've got more than 160 targets. Uh, so we've got a lot to do. Uh, but the, the, the idea that you can dismiss all this because it's gone from 8 to 17, uh, I, I find a little, a little too glib, really. I mean, we've all, we've all heard that argument over, over the last six to nine months. And, and I think it doesn't sort of get into the nuances of how national development plans will actually engage with the SDGs when they've been adopted. Nancy, Michael's calling me clip. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was just thinking as Michael was talking, um, one of the things about that was good about the MDGs that I don't think is said often enough is that they changed at the global level our definition in a normative sense of what development is. It's not just or mostly growth of economies. And that was important in 1990, excuse me, in 2000, to emphasize. They captured sort of a view of development that's about human development and about people. They also, however, had this quality that you could uh, set a rather specific goal and measure it. 
So although it's too bad that they weren't all met everywhere, Mm. the fact is that there was a way to hold countries accountable and indirectly in the context of the MDGs, the rich countries accountable for the extent to which they helped or not. Okay, so it was kind of around aid, but it had this good thing of measuring and making accountable. Okay, sustainable development goals. The, they have the same good thing around this change in our normative, our feel in some nuanced sense, what is important and good in the world. They've added to the human development dimension something additional, which is it has to be sustainable. It has to invoke and, and be about social justice in a larger sense. And one thing I didn't say earlier, that gets us to the system problems, which to me is important because you can't deal with the system problems without some collective action on the part of at least groups of countries, whether they're middle income, poor, rich, or whatever. And especially the rich have a role in addressing the systemic problems, like the failure to move on climate change, or how tough it is to deal with tax evasion, or what are we going to do about antimicrobial resistance to drugs, or about cybercrime. So much of development now is about those systemic issues, often at a global level. Do you think that the SDGs are achievable? Well, do I think that they're achievable tomorrow? No. Uh, do I think that they will be a process, uh, there will be a process by which uh, national governments around the world uh, commit themselves to sustain progress on the SDGs? Yes. And I think another thing uh, will happen which will make achieving the SDGs more and more likely over time, uh, and that is that we are seeing an explosion of civil society groups, particularly in the global south. Uh, who are enormously engaged in the process of putting together the SDGs and who, I believe, will be even more engaged uh, in the process of using the SDGs as a measuring device, just as the MDGs were, to make sure that their governments and other governments uh, meet the targets that they have committed to do. Yeah, I mean, you asked the question, are they achievable? And I suppose my... (laughs) My sense is it's not that important. I think, you know, it would be great to achieve them, but what's important is measuring progress mm. and the rate of progress and, and clarifying who is accountable for mm. what. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some, in some cases, a country is accountable. In some cases, many cases, increasingly, We don't know who to make accountable because they require collective action across sovereign nations. And that in itself is a huge challenge. So on women and girls, you know, you can measure it within countries over time. There are ways that can be, that can be done. And I think civil society groups, think tanks, like CGD will try to develop metrics and all Mm. of that. Uh, And that's progress in itself. It's more important that they're there, despite the fact that they're flawed. I see these goals as the world making a promise to itself. I mean, you you know, arguably the biggest promise the world has made to itself since that extraordinary set of documents in the post-1945 period that kind of went through the creation of the Bretton Woods Agreements, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and so on and so forth. This is the world making a promise to itself. And it's sort of, it's sort of a wonderful thing uh, that we're seeing happen. And because we're including so many of the broader uh, aspects of human progress uh, in, these, uh, in these goals, you know, we're making a promise to ourselves that we're one world, one planet, one society, one people, uh, who who look out for each other and look out uh, for how uh, uh, how we get along in the world uh, and how our one home uh, is uh, is going to be handed on to the next generation. That's a pretty big 
that's a pretty wonderful thing to do. You know, that's a pretty that's a pretty wonderful thing to do. So in a way, this is the SDG document. It's kind of like uh, a, a, de- a universal declaration of human rights for the age of metrics and data. <laughs> that's very well put. <laughs> and it reminds me, you know, we we work in Washington, all of us, and down the street we have the international financial institutions. And around the corner from them, we have the big U.S. aid agencies and the U.S. Treasury and the White House. So we're very sort of metric, measure, achievement oriented. I think it's worth keeping in mind that the United Nations is itself a sort of global public good in setting norms and in calling for collective action. It has a lot of trouble achieving collective action because, you know, we're a messy group of sovereign nations, each one with its own difficult politics, the U.S. particularly right now, honestly. But there's still been all these decades such an important role. So credit to the United Nations and its various agencies. It doesn't mean they can do everything and the sustainable development goals, they don't, they're not perfect. But I think what's important about them is what Michael was saying. You know, they capture something about a world in which, in principle, we could have more universal sense of where we're, we should be going. I think you just fell off the end of a lot of members of Congress Christmas card list <laughs> talking about the UN <laughs> how do well, you well sell- <laughs> trying to clarify its contribution you know and I think it's a mistake to expect everything from the UN just as it's a mistake to expect everything from the financial institutions that are global like the IMF and the hmm. World Bank if the um, SDGs represents a new paradigm, a new way of thinking about development, then what does that mean for aid? Which for many people is, you know, equates to development. As we know, development is about more than aid. Yeah, maybe we'll disagree a little bit. <laughs> no, uh, well, so let me, I, let me you answer go first, first, and then, yeah. I, I think, you know, if you think of the challenges for the world as very heavily now around collective action on common problems, common problem higher risks and costs for developing countries and poor people, but common problem. I think it's a healthy reminder that aid is a small part of the answer. Important where it's there, but it's a diminishing role relative to understanding policy and politics and finding ways to leverage better policy for people everywhere. Better policy in the U.S., better policy, you know, in Malawi, better policy in Morocco, South Africa, Indonesia, wherever it is. So we, so we, will, we will disagree a little bit, though not that much. The point that I emphasize is that although we know that when you look at those charts, aid is diminishing as a, as a, as a factor in the total de- development funding, compared with domestic resources added to remittances, added to global private investment. We also need to remember that the dollar of aid is not the same as a dollar of private investment or of domestic resources or of remittances. And that particularly when you get to the last billion of people in extreme poverty who are going to live disproportionately in fragile states, often in post-conflict situations, uh, in places where for some time uh, there are going to be very, very, what I call thin states, really thin, in other words, you know, kind of not a thick degree of state capacity. In a lot of those areas, aid is going to remain a really, really important part of the mix. And I do think it's important that as we kind of have these debates, you know, development is more than aid. Of course it is. Uh, domestic resources are where all the money is going to be. Of course it is. We get that. You know, you know, private investment, really important. Of course it is. But I do think it is worth reminding ourselves that over the next 15, 20 years, the, the, the less whatever the number is of people who le- really live in extreme poverty and in, and in destitution, for them, 
I think aid is going to continue to remain mm. really important. Yeah, I mean, that there's one nuance I'd add to that, which Michael will agree with, I'm sure, and that is, especially for the U.S., humanitarian assistance is, it has to grow, mm. unfortunately. Mm. It does. The climate problem is going to displace more and more people. And some people say, even the Pentagon, right, it'll raise security issues and conflict displaces people. And there's a good sense, it's good to be able to say that I think the US and USAID are the best in the world, honestly, on emergency relief. We're not doing very well right now on long-term refugee relief and, and assistance. But the future of aid is, to the extent there is still aid and there will have to be, for fragile states, et cetera, and for people suffering in conflict-ridden areas, it's going to be, the higher and higher proportion will be humanitarian assistance. And that's something maybe the development community yeah. should be thinking more about. We want to think more about that. What are the better models for, for delivery, effective and efficient delivery yeah. of those services? Well, of course, uh, CGD Zoen Bada just chaired a big panel convened Cash by risk. DFID looking at recommending using more cash as aid exactly. in humanitarian including situations. Exactly, including in those situations. Yeah, including right. in those situations. And in an area where the evidence suggests it's a very good idea. Yeah. So, finally then, um, with, your, with, with the, your venerable careers, the years that you have spent at the forefront of development, I'm trying to say this politely, mm. uh, <laughs> how does all the horse trading and the arguing over the SDGs compare to the atmosphere around the beginning of the MDGs, the genesis of that process. How does it compare? Do you remember that far? Oh, yes. No shame there. I think he's trying to say we're old. I think he's, I think, you know, Distinguished. The world, well, the world, the world is a very different place from, from, from the way it was in, uh, in 2000. It's a different place from the way, way it was in 2005, make poverty history. I mean, I often say in 2005, it's only 10 years ago, Twitter didn't exist, and Facebook was in, you know, three dorms at Harvard, or what have you. I, I mean, almost literally, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so if you go back to 2000 and the Millennium Declaration, the world truly, truly uh, was a different place. It was different politically. Uh, it was post-financial crisis. I'm sorry, pre-financial crisis. Uh, it was pre the, the it was pre 9/11. Mm -hmm. It was pre the post 9/11 wars. Uh, so the, the geopolitical, it was actually a, at the end of what we can now look back on, and, and historians are starting to write this, a sort of brief period of stability, peace, and... Uh, Post-Cold War. Uh, Post-Cold War, um, which was sort of an extraordinary period. Of course, terrible things happened, Rwanda, Bosnia, we, you know, you and I remember them. Uh, but, but historians are now looking back at that period as a, as a period between the wars, as it were. Yeah. So 2000 was very different. I mean, it was a very, very different moment in time from the one that we have now. Uh, and, uh, and so the debates were, were different. The nature of political leadership, I would say, uh, was a little different than it is now. Um, uh, we have turned into a society, that, a global society, uh, worryingly, in my view, the distrust institutions were, in, uh, were possibly for the uh, possibly for justifiable reasons. In other words, institutions don't earn our trust. Uh, but where our natural reaction is to distrust uh, institutional um, uh, potential solutions to global problems, and I think that's a challenge. I think in some ways it's made uh, putting together the SDGs a little bit more difficult. Uh, than it would have been, but I think at the end of the day we've done a pretty good job. Now let me say something about another dimension of difference, which I think is the changing role of the U.S. Because in 2000, you could still think of the U.S. as not even just a superpower, but mm -hmm. kind of a hyperpower. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it ruled the Western world. It had the magic of the marketplace. It had democracy. It has democracy. I don't mean. It's different now. Um, the U.S. is still a superpower, but it can't bully around in the best good sense of the word. 
the way it's we still sort of thought it could in 2000. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, its its model was and is being greatly challenged in part because of the global financial crisis. Its model of a mixed, you know, economy, very private sector oriented with a little bit of management. I think its ability to push and pull is challenged. We have the creation of the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Bank, and the BRICS Bank. Um, in, inside the multilaterals, the U.S. has a changing role. So it's tougher now. And also, we're at the end of, a, I hope, at the end of a recessionary period. In 2000, there was the boom, and the boom during the Millennium Development Goal management era. Now we're starting we're at the beginning of what could be a continuing low growth, austerity, etc. So those are differences that might make more of a difference than anything inherent in the architecture of the MDGs compared to the SDGs. But given all that, I think it's a tougher moment. The SDGs, as I said in the beginning, at least they command attention as a round collective action in many dimensions of the goals. It's no longer just, you guys out there, do it, and we'll pay for it. Now it's, wow, we have problems that we share, a lot of problems that we share, and we have to really think through how we can work together to address these changes in norms and attitudes and values that have been wonderfully reflected in the mishmash of 17 goals and 139 or whatever targets. Well, Nancy, Michael, always great to talk to you, listen to you, and learn from you. Thank you very much for joining me on this edition of the CGD podcast. Thank you, Rajesh, for bringing us together. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Rajesh. It was great fun. And don't forget, you can find out much more about everything that CGD does on our website, cgdev.org. I'm Rajesh Merchandani, and join me again for the next podcast from the Centre for Global Development. Mm-hmm.